thank you for your welcome and for those words. What this speaker did not make clear is the career advice was based on a speech impediment I had from age three. In fact, the night before I was sworn in, I had a recurring nightmare that I was sentencing a man and saying, now for all these reasons, I'm sentencing you to imprisonment for... Okay, let's make it three years imprisonment. <laughs> I feel somewhat sartorially out of step today, sandwiched as I am between two tireless keynote speakers, which reminds me of a story. I visited a secondary school, a large rural secondary school in the South Island. Spoke about sentencing. I divided the room into the defence half and the prosecution half. I gave them details of two or three cases and got them to stand up to argue for either tougher or lighter sentences. And they were great. They were a senior group, year 12 and 13, the kids we don't see in the youth court, with a future and a hope, and they were terrific. I said to them, some of them, in fact, were better than some bad lawyers. Instinctively, they were just great. I've never had so many questions and feedback. And at the end, there was a queue of young people asking questions. I could see one girl at the end clearly wanted to be last, and I was a bit worried about what she would be asking me. And finally the room was emptied and she came, she was the last speaker, and with a very soft voice looked at me after a long pause and said, where did you get your tie? <laughs> now that really threw me and I said, why do you ask? And she said, well, Saturday is my first school ball. Mum's made the dress, it's a great dress, but the farmer's son who's taking me, I think there's only one tie in the family, I've seen it, and it's terrible. It clashes awfully, it's going to be a disastrous school ball, it's wrecked. It's hopeless. But your tie, she said, <laughs> your tie would just match perfectly. And to be honest, while I've nodded and smiled for the last hour, I haven't listened to a word that you've been saying. <laughs> so I said, look, as it happened, I bought the tie in a market in Singapore. Her face dropped and said, Mum loves me so much she would have taken me to Christchurch, the nearest city, to buy the tie. And after we talked for a while, I said, look, take the tie, use it. She said, really? Yeah, she said, great. It was returned two weeks later. It had clearly been a great school ball, much the worse for wear. Uh, <laughs> been returned to its former glory now. But I learned a lot from that story. I learned if you're going to speak in public, don't wear a tie. <laughs> if you do, make sure you've got a spare. And most of all, realise, and this is a good uh, joinder for a Kiwi at 1.30 on a Monday afternoon, if you're going to speak, remember that just because your audience smiles and listens, or smiles and nods, it doesn't actually mean they're listening to a word that you are saying. <laughs> but thank you for the opportunity for a Kiwi to speak at this conference. Uh, I've been to Canberra once before. I was at Bruce Stadium, as it then was, when the Hurricanes led the Brumbies 14-0 after 10 minutes. I was on my feet, you beauties. The crowd was just silent. 81 minutes later with the score, Hurricanes 14, Brumbies 48. <laughs> Someone from the crowd stood up and said, it's all gone quiet, Kiwi, hasn't it? <laughs> there are several New Zealanders in the audience. I hope they won't be quiet during this conference. Why don't you wave your hand so you can see who here is from New Zealand, if you, if you have a look around. And it would be appropriate for me to greet you in our indigenous tongue by saying in a mana, in a reo, in a rangatera, in a hoe fa, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. That's acknowledging the, the respect and authority of this place, the people who are here, those who have gone before, the culture, the language, from those who have traveled a long way to be here, from the four winds. Thrice greetings. Can I take you back? in time, or across in time, to a cold, very busy Washington Metropolitan Railway Station at 8 a.m. in the morning with thousands of people rushing through. And a busker is playing a violin. She's playing four of the hardest Bach violin pieces ever written. And with those thousands of people that busy throng, very few people stop and listen. About 15 people throw small change to him as he plays. 
watched by a journalist from the Washington Post, of all things. And after four to five minutes, he stopped. No one applauded. No one seemed to notice. He'd made $32. He'd played well. He was using a violin worth $3.5 million. And his name was Joshua Bell, one of the leading violinists in the States. Two nights earlier, he'd played to the Boston Globe Theatre, sold out, average ticket price, 100 US dollars. In fact, the busking was set up by the Washington Post as an experiment to see how the environment conditions people's assessment of ability and talent and contribution. And one thing I wanted to say from the outset, we're talking about trajectories of offending. I say this as a judge, I guess, most of all, but all of us are involved in different parts of the youth justice system. We are so easily conditioned by the environment in which we deal with young offenders. Court, police stations, residential institutions, supervision programs, community-based programs. So easy to, I guess, dumb down the people that, the young people that we're dealing with, to make judgments and uh, stereotype assessments of them, and to miss the fact that we are dealing with individuals, many of whom have enormous talent that we miss, and have enormous futures. What Professor Halsey was talking about this morning, the need for to work individually, to bring about change. Recently in New Zealand, we had a judicial training program for judges, and one of the Youth workers said, he implored us, he said, whatever else you do, yes, you wear a gown, you earn the big buck, you have to do what the law says, you have to make decisions, but most of all, be merchants of hope. Merchants of hope. I've been called many things as a judge, but I hadn't had that description, merchants of hope, ever put in that challenging way. It applies to all of us if we're working with young people. When we talk about this challenging, I guess, ageless question about trajectories, preventing offending and reoffending. we need to remember that we are and have to be working with individuals as merchants of hope. My topic today was uh, acknowledgements to your great singer-songwriter Paul Kelly from Little Things, Big Things Grow. And I'd like to provide an overview albeit from a New Zealand perspective, of some of the emerging, the big trends, the big challenges, the big picture issues facing youth justice. Mind you, big is an overused word. James will play this video clip. What is this about big? You know, seeing the big picture, having the big idea, clinching the big deal. Nobody wants to clinch the little deal. Who wants to do that? Be a little deal clincher. A small shot. You know, when you go and get a burger, you want a Big Mac. You go to the front there, you ride the Big Dipper. You turn on TV and you see Big Bird. Are you afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? When I was growing up, I wanted to be the big man. I never wanted to be the little man. Even the little man wanted to be the big man. When you go to America, you want to go to the Big Apple, not the Little Apple. When I get up in the morning, I want a big breakfast. I want my girlfriend to say, good morning, big boy, to which I'll reply. I've got a big day today, a big meeting with the big cheese from a big studio. It's a big time for the big bucks. And she'll turn to me, rolling her big blue eyes and say, big head. I'll retort, what's the big deal? And give her a big kiss. I'll get into my big car, set up into the big wide world. She'll give me a big wave, close the door of our big house, look in the mirror and ask herself, does my bum look big in this? in my big meeting, I'll turn to one of the big hitters and I'll say, I love this movie, it's going to be big. Uh, there's only one small problem, my fee. I'd like it to be, um, what's the word? So at 1.30 on a Monday afternoon, let's think of some big picture ideas about youth justice. I want your contributions. Feedback is invited. There is no contempt of court this afternoon. I'm very keen to get your views in one sentence as to what you think 
are the big picture issues. A young person recently showed me a, a sign that said, arguing with a judge is like wrestling with a pig in mud. The more you do it, the more you realise the pig likes it. <laughs> so please, any contribution, I'm going to ask you shortly for interruptions. Interruptions are welcome. As in this video clip. Let's see. Please serve. <laughs> oh, well done, madam. You got a smile out of rapper. <laughs> I bet he's tempted to have a look. <laughs> So what would be some of your top 10 issues, challenges, themes, trends, if you were asked by your Minister of Justice or local youth justice agency? Shout them out. Adam's helpfully set some of that the theme this morning. I know some of you, so I'll be asking you if you don't shout out. So it's, e it's as easy as that. Some ideas, trends. Adam, choose one. Rise of female violent offences. Is there a place for rewards in the criminal justice system? Yeah. Role of social media. Yeah, responding to refugee young people. We have an issue in Wellington where I work with Somalian young boys who are disproportionately violent, significantly so. Educational engagement and early literacy. Yeah. More New Zealand table. Chris Palashik. How we manage welfare needs using justice models. More. practiced around child offenders. In New Zealand we talk about child offenders being 14 and under, youth offenders 14 to 17. My colleague Karen Fryer, head of the Children's Court Canberra, ACT, any trends that you've got in mind? Polysubstance abuse. Yeah. Any other comments? Could be rattling them out. Yes ma'am. not setting young people up to fail on conditional bail programs. The conditions being such that they're doomed to failure before they start. No consumption of cannabis, and yet they're a long-term chronic cannabis user. Yeah. How to not use justice models to manage welfare issues. This is warming up. working more effectively with crossover youth, crossover kids. Yeah. I guess all the people you were talking about, Mark, were all crossover kids at an early stage, to use that jargon word. Challenge public perception that young people are jobs that need to be hit harder and harder. Delivering service in remote communities, problem for you and us in New Zealand, yeah. Working with families, engaging families. Indigenous overrepresentation, yeah. Proportion of young people on remand and detention. I noticed, Adam, your figure is 60% higher in New Zealand grant, isn't it? It's more like 80%. Most of those don't go on to get a custodial sentence. Immediately there are questions, who on earth, meaning me or judges, would put them inside when they're not going to get custodial sentences? There is certainly an answer to that. Other comments? Well, 
get an executive to know what it's like on the coal front. Yeah. Challenge for indigenous judges into the system. We've got eight Maori judges in New Zealand, one Pacifica. It's been some enormous changes that those nine judges have brought from within. Youth participation in the process. Getting it culturally correct. Well, they are all, I think, each and every one, subjects that we could talk about and the seminars are talking about for hours. I've chosen 10, but like David Letterman's top 10. One person's perspective, I guess, through a judicial lens. And um, I'll work through them all. Some I'll spend longer on than others. I hope it's a way of touching common themes and providing a basis for what we will be engaging with for the rest of the conference. One point I thought I'd make just at the start, people ask, what's all this focus on youth offending for? Why have a specialist youth justice conference? This classic age crime bell curve applies, I am told, to every Western country. And it shows offending peaking just after the 17th birthday. And if you drop five years either side, it's over 60% of all offending covered by that age group. So it's a crucial, pivotal age to be dealing with. If we get it right here at this age, we're likely to get it right cheaper and more effectively than can ever be done with dealing with 25, 30-year-old and 35-year-old. So there's enormous challenge. Huge encouragement to me that they are Australasian Institute of Criminology, the judicial uh, administrators, would see it important enough as an issue in itself to get everyone together to talk about how can we do it better. So, my top ten. Might surprise you. If we're looking at trajectories, it seems to me we have to be aware of the emerging brain science. It's been said that the 2010s will be known as the decade of the adolescent brain. The 1990s were said to be the decade of the child brain. We will never know more in this decade, or we'll know more in this decade than we've known in the whole of human history before about the way the adolescent brain develops. And we know that that part of the brain that deals with judgment, common sense, impulse control, the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, undergoes a second growth and pruning stage starting at about age 14 or 15 and continuing into the late 20s. In fact, most of the educational theories that were based and brought up in the 1960s and 70s that said young people's brains were fully developed by about age 10, 11 and 12, then it was a matter of life maturity and experience, we know that those theories are wrong. We know without a shadow of a doubt, a whole new growth and pruning stage starts at about age 14. Those parts of the brain that haven't been used are pruned, new parts are developed. And you see it very clearly in this neuro image. Five top left going to 20. Blue is the bit of the brain, the frontal part, but the bit that deals with judgment, wisdom, and responsibility. And you can see how late in the development of the brain that part of the brain develops. We don't know, I'm told, whether this was always the case. But we do know that particularly for boys, the prefrontal cortex really fully matures early 20s. That's why I was telling the football managers and coaches and the soccer team at the secondary school I'm associated with that for some of the year 12 and 13 boys, the coaches are those boys' prefrontal cortex. They are their frontal lobes. They have to step in. 
when boys either arrive stoned or behave stupidly, they've got to step in and be the adult. And what it also means is that because puberty, the onset of which is starting much earlier, for girls aged 7 to 12, for boys 8 to 13, that's early onset, adolescence has never lasted longer. The gap that we're dealing with between early onset of puberty and final maturation of the frontal lobe appears never to, never to have been wider. Good health, good medical care is bringing down the age of puberty consistently. A hundred years ago for our grandmothers, it was said the earliest age for female early onset puberty was 12 or 13. It's dropped five years and a hundred years. It can't continue to drop. But there are some enormous it, there are some enormous issues that we face because of it. Mind you, that's probably always been the case. Now we just know why. Headlines in a Dunedin newspaper speaks for itself. Another headline. What's interesting is when it was written. So we're not talking about something new, but we at least have the scientific basis to understand it. This is the best summary of a youth court I've ever read. Would that there were no age between 10 and 3 and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there is nothing in between but getting wenches with child, wrong in the ancient trees, stealing and fighting. Shakespeare was right. Plato was right. They're rude and impatient. They binge drink. They frequently inhabit taverns. Below age with no identification. There was probably the Cairo Institute of Criminology being at similar conference 6,000 years ago. But no Facebook. But what it means, simply put, is that the prefrontal cortex deals with rational thinking. All of you here, as fully functioning adults, at least until about 2 o'clock, will be working hard with your prefrontal cortex. You'll be assessing, analysing, thinking. Do I get that or do I not? If you were 16, you'd be dealing with that small peanut-sized amygdala deep in the brain that deals with emotional responses. That's why the teenagers we work with are so black and white, and deal so emotionally with how they feel about a judge or a sentence or a caseworker or a residential worker. Very famous study took six emotions and asked young people to match the emotion with the face. Which one is surprised? Which one is surprised? Call it out. Bottom left, correct. Which one is fear? Middle, bottom. Which one is joy? Top left. Which one is disgust? Top right. Which one is sadness? Top middle. Which one is anger? Anger? bottom right. When that test was done in the States, every adult, as you have done, got it 100% right. For a group of over 2,000 young people, 50% only got them all right, and most commonly, 50% mismatched fear as being either surprise or anger. So not only do teenagers act emotionally, but they frequently, in black and white ways, pick out what they think is the key emotion and misread emotions. I always remember reading a summary of facts of a boy in Wanganui when I was first a district court judge. When I left, I said there would be three boys, I thought, who were capable of committing murder. Two of them are now in prison for murder. One boy, let's say Kelvin, used to fly into these black rages. Soon after I left, he was convicted of murder. I remember reading the summary of facts. And he'd walk down the main street of Wanganui at midnight, bumped into men coming out of a stag party, and accidentally knocked a man over who got up, and Kelvin said he had anger written all over his face. Interestingly, the bystanders and part of the group said the man looked shocked and surprised. 
Kelvin read it as anger and went to one of those black rages and a minute later the man was dead on the main street of Wanganui. We asked what could have been behind Kelvin doing that. Since the age of two he had been tied to a tree and beaten with an alkathene pipe by his dad. You'd think his dad should be standing next to him in the dock. Then you read that his grandfather, Kelvin's dad's dad, in a fit of rage pulled out a shotgun and shot off the left shoulder of Kelvin's grandmother, the man's wife. You talked about intergenerational violence, and that's a chilling example. But Kelvin was someone who, from an early age, reacted emotionally and often got the emotions wrong. This is a very famous study, too, on risk-taking with green, yellow, and red lights. And young people were asked to drive the car and stop the car at the very last minute before the brick wall and before the lights went red. What was interesting is that when adults did it by themselves and kids did it by themselves, adults were slightly better. Kids didn't take the risks. When kids' close friends were brought in to stand with them and say nothing and just observe, but when other teenagers were present, they took twice as many risks with twice as many crashes. So we know that the teenage brain, being as it is, is exceptionally influenced or prone to take risks, and that risk-taking doubles when other friends and peers are around, which is why so much youth offending takes place in groups with boys, and also why it's so easily caught. The police in New Zealand talk about it as low-hanging fruit. Spontaneous, idiotic, spur-of-the-moment offending. And it explains and is depicted beautifully in this video clip. also worthwhile me just briefly talking about the effect of uh, alcohol on the teenage brain. James, if, yeah, we can there. Those figures are likely to be similar for Australia. A memory test, brain activity highlighted in red. A memory test, a 15-year-old male non-drinker on the left, 15-year-old male heavy drinker on the right, both sober during the test. Look at the memory functions that are lit up by the non-drinker as opposed to the drinker. So I guess what I'm saying is this, if we're working with young people, we have to get to grips with what the brain science is telling us, especially if we're talking about trajectories. You see, one thing the brain science tells us pretty clearly is that most young people will age out of offending and you could almost take an overstated view if we did nothing. Time will take care of it. But there are implications for legal ages, for instance, driving licenses, drinking ages, how we sentence. There's a trilogy of United States Supreme Court cases that import all this research into each of the three decisions, which are all a predictable 5-4 decision, but they all strike down state laws as being unconstitutional for young people based primarily on the brain science. They're worth reading, and they're all in the paper that I've produced for this talk that will be available afterwards. So my first point, the importance of understanding and applying what the brain science is telling us. Second point, I guess it follows from the first. If it's correct that many or most young offenders will age out of their offending without much intervention, why would we bring them to court? Why would we use the resources of the court to deal with them and are we aware of the risks inherent in using that traditional, long-employed method? What flows from that, and this is what I don't want to do, which is to be jargonistic and a little bit uh, 
determinative and predictive about young people, but roughly we know, we know there are two types of young offenders. Longitudinal study after longitudinal study has demonstrated this. This group, adolescent onset only, D-sisters, this is the major group of young offenders. Who we can work really effectively with. A much more serious group is that little small group, the Chris's of this morning, who are a much tougher group and persist well into their 20s and 30s, and the challenge is how to get them to desist. Those desisters, let me just put that up. What do we know about them? And I guess the good news is that they can be dealt with in positive pro-social community-based ways. In New Zealand, we've got a senior youth aid officer here. We've got 250 full-time youth aid police constables who only deal with young people and spend their time working out who can best benefit from diversion. In many areas, they're, eating, they're reaching 75 to 80 percent diversion rates. And they're not charged, and most don't reoffend. But there is a but. We need to know, too, what are some of the key risk factors for that group who desist. And that's usually behind their offending. They're usually at school. So often it's drugs, friends, often tr trauma and trouble at home. So that's the group called D-sisters who might age out, age out a lot quicker with good community-based intervention. Persisters, on the other hand, we could talk a lot about them. This is the group that probably does come to court, challenges us all. And they're a tough group. I love that quote. A substantial body of longitudinal research consistently points to a very small group of males who display, display high rates of antisocial behaviour across time and in diverse situations. The professional nomenclature may change, but the faces remain the same as they drift through successive systems aimed at curbing their quote-unquote deviant schools, juvenile justice programs, psychiatric treatment centres and prisons. Such a tough group. No one's suggesting that they wouldn't be charged. I must say the problem with this typology is that it's easier to see retrospectively than prospectively. And I always have difficulty in the idea of labelling some offenders as being adolescent only, some as life course. You only know for sure when they're 20 or 30. But the risk factors for some are really high, and it's likely we can identify this sort of group. And it's interesting, Mark, you were talking about this morning what's behind that group desisting. It's a very famous study in Harvard, and they brought it down to four things. A good role model in life, employer or teacher, a good life partner, a genuine Christian conversion, or involvement in the armed forces. Those four things most contributed to uh, wrecking the statistical prognosis of long-term persistent offending. And it ties in exactly what you or boys were saying in terms of having someone who believed in them. In New Zealand, this is just a short and very, I think, tragic but quietly compelling assessment of those tough kids who need to come to court, who aren't diverted. Look at that 83% male. Look at the long-term family issues. But that 83% male, I had the privilege of sitting in the Hammersmith Youth Court in central London, that 83% male 
exactly the same figure, 12,000 miles away. So, to conclude regarding diversion, if we accept that four out of five young offenders are pretty well grounded in their community, they will desist quickly. Good intervention can take place in the community and does not need to come to court. I think all of us should be aiming for 80% diversion rates as a minimum. We should be going back to our countries, our states, our cities and saying, what are our diversion rates? Do they reach 80%? If they don't, I think we are practicing youth justice badly. We know it's consistent with the brain science. We know that formal contact with the juvenile justice system increases criminal activity, not decreases it. And we know it's consistent with the United Nations Convention. And we know a little bit about why going to court is bad awful word, peer contagion, but you know what we mean by it. 14-year-old early into the youth justice system is, as it were, immune to any good that can be done by the system at 16, 17 and beyond. Living up to the label. Actually, Christchurch was a good example in New Zealand prior to the earthquake. The police circulated their list of the 30 worst youth offenders. Trouble was, numbers 31, 32, 33 would bust a gut to get in the top playing 30. <laughs> Living up to the label. What happened in New Zealand with our Children, Young Persons and Their Families Act 1989 was an enormous direction to the police not to charge unless the public interest required otherwise and there was no alternative means of dealing with it. I love that graph. It d demonstrates a quiet legal revolution that took place in criminal justice in New Zealand. Court numbers went from 12,000 to 2,000 in the youth court. Most youth courts in New Zealand now only sit one day a fortnight. There's no full-time youth court judge. There isn't the work for it. And it means then the court is freed up to concentrate on the 10 to 20% who commit 50 to 60% of offences. That's a bit of a skew with graph because it goes to 120% to shave the top 10% off. But look, you go to 10% along the horizontal axis, over 40% of offending, go to 20%, 60% of offending. That's the group that we should be dealing with in court. That's where we should be directing the enormous resources of the formal state justice system. Third top ten. Everyone said it. In New Zealand, it's striking. I'm conscious that shortly to speak is Juan Prairie, a New Zealander who's had a, although he wouldn't know it, quite an influence on me, talking about demonization of indigenous young offenders, young people. So it's worth me saying a few things at this stage. One is that it's still only a very small percentage of the overall Maori population who offends. And secondly, what research there is tends to indicate that it would be wrong to talk about Maori young people. It'd be better to talk about culturally disconnected Māori young people. And several studies have shown that for those Māori young people who are involved with their marae, with kapahaka groups, cultural groups, waka ama, canoe paddling, their rate of offending is no greater than any other young person in New Zealand. So when we talk about Māori offending, we may be talking about a very small subset of those young Māori men who are dislocated from their culture, which may actually be another way of saying they're socioeconomically disadvantaged. Because if you're asking for the causes of this, the two big causes have to be long-term disadvantage wrought by colonial imposition and, and I say this as a judge, part of the system, systemic discrimination and bias. There can't be any other explanations for it. The complex interchange between those two factors, we could talk about a lot. But we are doing in New Zealand, 
I think, something that's quite strikingly revolutionary in New Zealand context, which is where possible to take Māori young offenders from the court to their local marae, or would be described as a cultural meeting place, where there's a meeting house, accommodation, land set aside. The law allows any judge to direct a sitting of a court to take place at any place a judge deems convenient. I'm sure the legislation was meant for the hospital bed accused murderer, but it's wide enough and it is being used in New Zealand for hundreds of Maori young offenders to have their next case ordered to be heard on the marae. Our eight Maori judges have led the way in this. Let me just give you a wee clip. They would come every fortnight in the morning, five or six young offenders, a whole group, including all the youth justice team, police, social workers, community workers, the judge, the court staff, to be welcomed onto the marae with all the young offenders and their family as a group. So we'll just start playing this to so get an idea of what I'm saying. There would then be a formal welcome, there would be a cup of tea with everyone, and each case is heard one by one. This is how it's set out in the marae, the judge in the middle, Māori elders, male and female seated next to him. We'll just show you the start of it. Case has been called of this young boy. We've kept the, the actual audio down so they can't identify anyone. He would always start learning his own miti or Māori greeting. He'd be helped to do that. And elders seated around the table would encourage him with that. So the early prognosis has been hugely encouraging. I can tell you that on the marae, the aggression and the angst and the anger is significantly diminished. Young people turn up willingly with their family. The atmosphere is quite different. There is much better engagement. There's a chance to utilise community resources. All government departments have bought into it. We're cautiously optimistic that it's not a magic bullet, but it is a significantly different cultural approach to take the court out of the Pakeha, the European environment, and place it in a quite different cultural environment. On the one hand, people would say what they, they would call it in New Zealand bounty bar justice, brown on the outside, but still white man's justice underneath, and it still uses the same law. Others would say, on the right, it is apartheid and drag. What right do we have to treat Maori young people any differently from non-Maori young people? These are issues where we're grappling with but there are some significant changes that we are trying to introduce to alter the trajectory of offending and reoffending by Māori young people. You talked about female violence this morning, Adam. I sat recently in a youth court in New Zealand. Three separate aggravated robberies of corner dairies were all committed by girls. We know that while overall youth apprehensions are dropping in New Zealand, and I think in Australia, violent apprehensions are increasing, bucking the trend. Still a small group because they're lost in the overall decline, but violence is going up for every age group in the country. And you could say for boys, we know that they are developmentally 10 or 11 year olds in the turbocharged body of an Israel Palau at age 16, whose violence is drunken, random, spontaneous, gratuitous, and nasty. But for girls, they are 16-year-olds and with the life experience of a 24-year-old, and their violence is sober, targeted, usually in a group. 
seems to us there is an enormous correlation and parallel history of violent girls and prior sexual and family abuse. Almost 100% match. It's a rising popular topic in New Zealand. There are clearly some unique concerns for female offenders and I look forward to the address tomorrow on the topic. But we're sure in New Zealand that we haven't really got to the bottom of it. We don't really have female-specific programs in sufficient number, and it's an enormously challenging issue, and we need more work on it. Fifth trend. It's interesting, anyone from New Zealand is going to talk to you about family group conferences. You won't shut us up. It's set out in detail in the paper, but you know, I had a big debate, discussion with Professor Chris Kaneen from New South Wales, and what we quickly realised is his definition of family group conference and mine were quite different. So we're often not comparing apples with apples. What you need to know in New Zealand is that they must occur, they're statutorily mandated for really the worst 20 to 30% of offenders. There is no choice. They must occur if the police seek to lay a charge and there is no arrest. It's a form of diversionary family group conference. Child, youth and family, Chris Balashek is here, they run that. So if a young person hasn't been arrested, but they need to come to court, they can't be come to court without a family group conference. There must be a family group conference if the charge comes to court and it's not denied. Don't even have to admit it, just not denied. That is for everything apart from murder and manslaughter, everything. It is compulsory and mandatory. There are 8,000 family group conferences run in New Zealand a year. Done well, in my view, they have in them the seeds of genius. And I won't go through all the other material here because it's all in the paper. But you could say three key features, and I think these are trends especially in the South Pacific countries, it's the partial transfer of power from the state to the, to the community. It's a mechanism for producing a negotiated community family-based response, and victims are involved in a key way. We won't play the video James, that looks at a family group conference. We'll just go on. You may be surprised by this, but I think a real trend, particularly in the South Pacific Island nations and New Zealand, is the rise of what might be called lay or community input into the youth justice process. In my view, our system has, the court-based system has for too long been locked up by professionals, quote-unquote, or so-called experts, and we don't hear enough from the community, particularly from a cultural point of view. You said getting it right culturally. And if we're looking about altering trajectories, we have to ask ourselves, do we need to provide more room for what might be called, it's an awful word, lay advocate, community-based people? Interestingly, the framers of our 1989 Act in New Zealand had the vision Lay advocates could be appointed free of charge by the court to ensure the court is made aware of all cultural matters and to represent the interests of the child or young person's family. That is a voice for the family in the process. Court appointed and free of charge. And you know what? Those community advocates are accessing information that many social workers and police can't reach. They're providing additional information to the court. They're helping to galvanise families. By and large, Chris, they're working well with social workers, but that is the tension point between community advocates and social workers. We've got a long way to go, but I think an important trend is to be thinking about opening up our court process to the community and letting the community become the conscience of the youth court. This is a trend, the growing understanding of neurobiological difficulties and their significance. Some of you adverted to this. The English Children's Commissioner 
has just in 2013 put out a report where he analyzes each of these neurobiological disorders. There is growing interest in all of them. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, if the figures are right in New Zealand, and there's, uh, if the f overseas figures applied in New Zealand, and there's every reason to think with our binge drinking culture they do, there must be 600 out of the three and a half to 4,000 young people in the youth court who suffer from fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and we miss it. And many of our interventions are compromised because of it. We've got a good program with an awful name called a military activity camp, which is actually a, a wilderness adventure therapy run by the army. It's terrific. It's a platform for change. One of the boys who responded best reoffended within a week back in Dunedin. Why? Because when the real work was done, he was found to be seriously fetally alcohol spectrum disordered. So cognitively, he was simply unable to take in what had been done. He needed clear boundaries and discipline that he'd been getting while in the residence. Take those away, he reoffended within a week, seriously. That is a spectacularly compelling graph, in my view. Look at the reported prevalence rates among young people in custody of each of those disorders. And if that doesn't stop us in our tracks, nothing will. You can ask, I can't answer, but at the bottom is the source and that will tell you everything. Everyone seems agreed much more on this. Even Mark reluctantly conceded that cognitive behavioral therapy at least provides a moment to think about stopping offending. The real issue then, how do they follow that through? And no cognitive behavioral therapy can make you do that but it can make you think about wanting to change. There is hope, people. We need to hang on to this. There is hope. We know more about what to do to reduce offending by young people than ever before. We know what doesn't work, and let me tell you what doesn't work. Don't even read that. Boot camps don't work. Scared straight camps don't work. Job training without anything else doesn't work unless the underlying offenders, the, uh, the underlying issue is looked at. We had boot camps in New Zealand. They were a wonderful failure. <laughs> Three months on the volcanic plateau of New Zealand where they ran hard, were up at six, the sergeant major said jump and the only response was how high. And they left after three months faster, fitter, well-fed, fantastic specimens of young human beings, but they were still burglars, just much harder to catch. 94% reoffended. I mean, why we're even using the word boot camp? I mean, it is a dismal, total, complete, and abject failure. So is custody, we know that. And in New Zealand, the typical response is to segregate our worst away from mainstream and then aggregate them together. And that's a tough recipe for enduring reform, drug and alcohol, education, all those areas. We've seen the same revolution in 89. But we haven't seen it with bail and custody remands, and that perplexes me. Why 80% of our residential beds are reserved for custody? I'm, usually it's because of the short term. There's nowhere else for a young person to go. It's used as a way of convenient stabilisation. But if we could find other ways of convenient community-based stabilisation, we'd cut our residential bed use probably by 60, 70%. I won't go through this. Suffice to say, we know that in New Zealand, nearly 80% of those in contact with the formal youth justice system have an existing care and protection history. I guess the sad reality is we talk about the crossover kids, care and protection, but in the same breath there's this growing public clamour for tougher 
ever tougher sentences, adult crime, adult time. The brain science says not only is that wrong, but look at the life history. Of course, there are public interest safety issues. We have to use formal imposition and custody, but we're doing it, you know, for kids who have been beaten with an alkaline pipe from the age of two. It's a very small group, enormous public concern, but when we see who they really are, I can't help think in a hundred years' time to look back on this generation as being a terribly crude way of dealing with offenders. Just as we look at the Victorian era with horror, so will we be judged and condemned for how we're dealing with those small group of the toughest kids who are actually damaged goods from soon after birth, not of their own making. Can we go to the last two slides to conclude with? The tenth point, incidentally, was suggesting that the youth courts are laboratories for change that can spawn new initiatives in the whole adult system. And I list several that I think immediately the adult system could just grab and apply. And we're too quiet. Most times media aren't allowed into the youth court. The public doesn't know the good work that's going on in the youth justice system. We've got a positive story to tell. We've got innovations and interventions that work, and they would work just as well in the adult court. And we need to think, I think, about being evangelists for principles that apply cross ages. But I want to finish with that message of being merchants of hope. Him, he's not his name, but he committed an aggravated robbery. He was a lookout, corner dairy aggravated robbery. He went to a family group conference with 35 people there. It took eight hours. The corner dairy owners were there. It was very moving. He ended up actually working for the corner dairy people for two years. But you know, in that environment of youth offending, no one knew that Hemi had a talent, like the violinist. No one knew he had a talent. He said, what I'd like to do is not only write an apology, but to write a song and put it to words. And this is the song and the words of a 15-year-old boy consigned with the label of persistent life course offender, early rejection from school. This is what he wrote. And I'll just finish with this, with the theme of hope and that trajectories aren't permanent. He sent this to the victim who sent it to the court. This is the second and last verse. So in conclusion, despite all the theories of trajectories, let's be personally in our individual dealings with young offenders merchants of hope, committed to changing lives, committed to beginning a new era, helping the sun shine through. Thank you.